Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labour and agony to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, he might devour her child. But she gave birth to a son, a male who's going to shepherd all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be there for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out the ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have now come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives in the face of death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows he has a short time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, as I put this big book over there, don't worry, I've still got a Bible here on the lectern. Uh, there's a sermon outline that'll appear up here on the overhead. And you've got space there in your sheets. There's a sermon insert for today with the Bible readings at the top. Uh, if you want to write any notes, uh, there's the opportunity. If you want to ask questions at the end, there's an opportunity for that as well. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, over the last two years, many things have struck me over the last two years. Uh, Christmas is much harder with a face mask is one of them. Uh, one of the things that's struck me over the last few years is that we're fascinated by the backstory. We're fascinated by the backstory. Uh, the story behind the story. Uh, the look behind the scenes. The truth beneath the surface. Uh, when I was growing up and uh, I went to school at Maroubra Bay Public School, uh, we used to watch Behind the News every week. I don't know if you remember that show, BTN. Uh, we'd watch Behind the News every week and we'd finally learn what was going on behind the news, the real events. Uh, in fact, uh, just in this last week, a new documentary has been released from the Olympics. that happened. Remember those Olympics that happened so long ago? Uh, Jess Fox, the greatest kayaker in history, has just released a documentary called Greatest to Gold. In her favourite event, she bombed out. She only got a bronze. Two days later, she had a triumph in a new event. And it's a behind-the-scenes look at how she managed to get to that. Uh, even during COVID, there's been a lot of digging, hasn't there? Behind the scenes, to look at the backstory, to get the truth. We're fascinated by the backstory. Why? Well, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Because the backstory gives us the details, doesn't it? The backstory gives us the facts. The backstory gives us the context, the explanation, the revelation, the truth. When you get the backstory, you understand what's happening in front of you. And Christmas has a backstory, doesn't it? And it's a corker. We're going to look at that in a moment. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for today. Thanks for being able to wake and be reminded in presence of your presence that you sent your son Jesus to take on flesh, to take on the devil, to take on our sin, to grow to be a man who died for us, 
because he lived in a way we couldn't, who rose for us to say that we could have life. Father, as we look at this backstory from your perspective, help us to understand what is happening behind the scenes, behind the cradle, and the good news that lies in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the backstory that we've just read, I hope you've still got the book of Revelation open, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, the backstory is pretty astounding. I've yet to have found a dragon Christmas card pack. And Hollywood has not even been game to turn this backstory into a real movie. It's got the strangest nativity scene ever. It's got the greatest war ever. And it's got the most certain of victories ever. And it gives us a glimpse of Christmas from the perspective of God. The best backstory you can get. It's taken from the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation is a book that some people revere and some people revile. Many of us misunderstand and misapply. It's really not a complicated book. There's a bloke called John who follows Jesus. He's been locked up. And God gives him a glimpse of the backstory. He takes him behind the scenes and shows him all of history from God's perspective. In a broken world where God's mob are being attacked and persecuted, there are three simple truths. God's in charge, Jesus is the boss, and God's mob will survive. God's in charge, Jesus is the boss, and God's mob will survive. And that truth is repeated time and time again right throughout the whole book, looked at from different angles, different perspectives, and in different ways. And the complication emerges when you have to deal with the language of the book. I I hope you noticed there's a lot of picture language in that reading that I just read. The book works with pictures, and the problems happen when we get the pictures wrong. Isn't that always the way? When you get the picture wrong, you get the truth wrong. Uh, The pictures would have been able to be understood by the first readers. They're around AD 90. They're a bunch like us. A bunch like us. So when they got this first book, they would have understood it. And they would have understood it because the rest of the Bible helps them get the pictures. It starts with a really strange nativity scene. I'm at point two on the outline. If you've got your Bibles there, look at verse one. A great sign appeared in the heaven. A woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labour and agony to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns. On his heads were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven, hurled them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, He might devour her child. But she gave birth to a son, a male who's going to shepherd all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be fed there for 1,260 days. I love living in a country town at Christmas. One of the things our family does is that after Carol's on the lawn, we hop in the car and we go for a drive because everyone's put up their Christmas lights, haven't they? Uh, In Gunnedah, if you're the winning street, you become Christmas Street for the rest of the year. There's prizes handed out for the best display in one house or a whole street. Uh, Many of the displays are are a slightly skewed take on that nativity scene. Uh, If you've seen them this year, you'll have Santa camp next to reindeer in front of a stable with snowmen in an Australian summer. None is as strange as the one we've just read. None is as strange as that one. Uh, there's a great sign. Uh, it's a woman. All the lights of nature are attached to her. The sun, the moon, 12 stars. She's pregnant. She's in labour. She's in pain. There's another sign. It's not great, but it's there. It's like a strange mockery. It's a dragon, massive, red. Similar signs of authority attached to it, but they're pale imitations of those great lights, aren't they? He's he's a wannabe authority. And this dragon is thrashing around. 
This dragon is damaging the world. This dragon is ripping apart the substance of nature. This dragon wants to eat the baby. The woman gives birth. A son is born. The nature of his gender is emphasized. Did you see that? A son, a male. He's got a future. He's going to rule the world. He's saved from the dragon by God. He's kept safe. The woman is kept safe, and it's only a matter of time. Can you imagine if you drove down Saunders Street and saw that on someone's front lawn? Can you imagine if you went up Ugoa Street and someone had thought, let's put a dragon in the nativity? Well, what's going on here? Well, you get a bit of a clue in the next section when things are just as strange. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse seven with me. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent who's called the devil, Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. For a moment, it's just as bizarre, isn't it? You're taken up into heaven. And you get to see things that are happening there that seem to mirror what's going on in earth. There's a war. God's delegated the war to his army. Michael and his mob are fighting the dragon and his mob. The war is won. The dragon is finally unmasked. Did you see that there in verse 9? Who's the dragon? Well, we've met the dragon before, haven't we? Way back in the first book of the Bible, in the third chapter, he's the same sneaky, seductive, slithery, lying snake that we meet there at the start of the Bible. Now, if you pause for a moment and you know your Bibles, all the pennies should be dropping and all the light bulbs should be coming on. And now we see the backstory. You see, the backstory starts with a rebellion. And rebellions are only effective when there's something to rebel against, aren't they? That's why they're rebellions. And the rebellion started way back there in the third chapter of the Bible. God had made man and woman. He'd made the world. God had given them an abundance to live life in line with his word. They lacked nothing to live in his way. And then this snake slithered in, this seductive little serpent, and he spoke sneaky little lies and said, God doesn't love you. God's stingy. God doesn't care about you. God can't be trusted. You can do better without God. In fact, let me tell you, you can be God instead of God. There's nothing new for that serpent. Remember that description in verses 3 and 4? This has been the serpent's life. He's a pretender. He's an imitator. He wants the world for himself. And this snake, the devil, has made it his life's mission to persuade us with a lie. You can do better without God. Now, it all seems a little strange and unbelievable and really you wouldn't have expected this to be the sermon in Narrabri in Christmas, would you? But it actually makes sense of the world we live in, doesn't it? If you look around our world, this is reality. We want life without God. We've been persuaded by that lie that life is better without God. And if you watch those stars fall in verse 4, you'll know how broken the world is, won't you? How hard it is how much it aches, how much it hurts, how much it is broken. The Bible's got a very small word for that, hasn't it? It's the word sin. Sin's an easy word to understand. Uh, when I do scripture, all the kids in scripture understand the word sin because it's got I in the middle. Sin is life where I am God. Well, I can do better without God. In fact, where I can do a better job than God himself. How do you think that's gone for us? Every rebellion has a response. 
Now, this one's no different. Back there in the third chapter of the Bible, God himself responds and deals with that rebellion. Listen to what God promises way back there in the first book of the Bible. He's speaking to the snake and he says, I'll put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He'll strike your head, you'll strike his heel. God knows that this will bring war. It's inevitable. But did you see that the outcome's already sorted? The snake will strike the heel of one of the offspring of the woman and that heel will crush the snake's head. So not only do we have an idea of who the snake is, the devil, the liar, we now have an idea of who the woman is in this strange nativity. This is God's mob. This is God's people. And one will come from God's mob who will crush that snake. And the snake doesn't like it. The snake doesn't like this future. And so he spends the rest of his life slithering around the world, spreading lies and biting and lashing. A God's response leads to a, rep- a repudiation. Uh, when someone saw me typing up the sermon outline, they said, what's repudiation, Dad? And I said, well, it's kicking out, throwing out, pushing away. That's what God does with the devil. Get out. That's what God does with humans too. You can have what you want. Go and try life without me. See how well it works. And so life in this world consists of this. Humans believe that God is stingy and they can do better without him. The devil is spreading his lies and keeping the rebellion going. And this promise of a boy hangs over it all. And the boy's born. Why else are we here today? And he comes from God's mob. Mary gave birth to Jesus. And his life is summarized there in verse 5, the shortest biography in history. She gave birth to a son, a male who's going to shepherd all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And this is the turning point of the war. Every war's got a turning point. This is the turning point. God promised a boy and he came. God promised that one of his mob would give birth to this boy and Mary did. God promised that one would crush the head of the devil. That's why he's wanting to devour this baby and God protects the baby. Uh, If you go a little further in the reading that Pete bought, we were given a hint, weren't we? Herod hears about this pretender to his throne and what does he do? He lashes out in violence and he devours and God protects his boy. God enthrones his boy. God raises his boy. God makes his boy king, rescuing him so that he could rescue the world. So now we understand our little nativity scene, don't we? Christmas is the turning point in the conflict between God and those who want to be God. Christmas is the moment when God's promise that a boy would come takes place in a world that wants nothing to do with God. Christmas is the moment when the boy God promised would come came to deal with our greatest problem, that we believe the lie that life is better without God. Christmas is the time when this boy comes and his coming shows that God is not stingy. God is abundantly generous. Christmas is the time when the dragon crashes the nativity and crashes out. Christmas is the time when we remember the backstory. Now, in one sense, there's no real suspense about this backstory, is there? We know the outcome. After all, we know that the boy is kept safe. We know that the devil's not even strong enough to defeat the commander of God's armies, let alone God himself. But there's still some suspense about the impact of this dragon on the world. Uh, And Steve touched a little bit on it, didn't he? as he gave us that image with those Lego figures of what this dragon can do. But that suspense is put to bed when a loud voice speaks out. Look at verse 11, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and his authority of his Messiah have now come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb 
by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives in the face of death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great fury because he knows that he has a short time. It's really just an expansion of verse 5, isn't it? The biography of Jesus. The boy grew up. We heard that last night. He grew up to be a king. His kingship is unrivaled. He has authority over even the devil. How is that displayed? Well, you see it there in verse 11. The victory is achieved by the blood of the Lamb. It's just another picture image for that boy, isn't it? But he didn't die in the cradle. He didn't die when he was two. He didn't die at any other time when people tried to take his life. He died when it was right for him to die. On the cross for our sins, where the one who had done no evil the one who knew that God was enough, who did not believe the lie, waded into battle that was bloody and beat the dragon, crushed the head. In that he showed that the lie has no substance and in his resurrection he showed that life is better with God. No wonder he rules the world. He beat death. And that victory is displayed in this world by the testimony of the mob connected with him. They live out the truth that life is better with God, connected to his king. They do that even in the face of their own deaths. That rule is so good it is worth dying for. And that snake keeps slithering around with his lies, his head crushed, still trying to persuade. Only for a time, only for a short time. Did you notice that at the end of verse 12? He has only a short time. Well, what a backstory. It changes, it deepens the nature of Christmas, doesn't it? It's a great holiday, but it's not just a holiday. It's a great time for food and festivity, but it's not just that. It's a great time to remember the end of one year and look forward to another, but it's not just that turning point, is it? Christmas is the turning point in the great, all of history, all of humanity, conquest of evil, the defeat of the rebellion, the exposure of the lie that life is better without God. As we celebrate this event every year, we must be reminded that there is a dragon in the nativity and he is beaten by the boy. It's not a surprise. It's not random. It's exactly as God promised. So what are we going to do about it? Well, on one level, we could be silly and try and create such a nativity and put it on our front lawn. But let me tell you that I think there are four very simple things we need to do with it as we move forward into the day. It makes sense of the world. It makes sense of the world. It explains that strange mix in our world we have today of giving gifts and then having arguments of both good and evil seeming to be mixed, at least on the surface. It explains the reality and the source of all the brokenness that we feel. It explains the way in which God and Jesus and their people live in this world. The backstory makes sense of the world. Second, it explains the significance of Christmas. This is the turning point. Every year we remember this, the moment when the war turned. It's a moment to rejoice, thirdly. The baby grew up and crushed the head of the dragon. No amount of opposition to God, no amount of sneaky little lies, no amount of ridiculing can undo this truth. The dragon did not get the baby, and so the dragon was defeated. Isn't that good? Worth rejoicing in? But finally, at every turning point, we've got to work out which side we're on. We've got to consider with whom we stand. There is a question every Christmas. Are you with God or are you with the dragon? 
Are you with God or are you with the dragon? Every year we need to ask ourselves that question. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you took up that baby boy. Thank you that you sent him. Thank you that you protected him. Thank you that this boy grew to be a king who ruled with an iron scepter over even death. Thank you that he did it for the goodness of true life. Thank you that he exposed the lie, that life is better without you. Thank you that this boy grew to be the man Jesus who crushed the dragon. Father, help us to know this backstory and so know life and so rejoice. Give us that truth today. In Jesus' name, amen.